Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for giving up your sunny uh, Friday evening to think and speak about the ECHR and uh, where we are with it in, uh, in Ireland. Of course, uh, PILA have the trick of these Friday afternoon sessions, which is the free wine afterwards, uh, which I'm sure we're all looking forward to. Um, so what I want to do today in my paper is uh, possibly the reason why someone might be able to say that I'm uh, prolific, and that is the typical academic thing that I'm sure really annoys practitioners, which is to just identify problems and ask some questions and not have to spend the time working the answers out. So hoping that through practice um, those answers get worked out. And I'm going to do that by focusing on the ECHR Act 2003 uh, itself, rather than looking at the content of the convention itself. And there are two reasons, there are three reasons for that. The first reason is that the content of the convention itself is unmanageable in 30 minutes, first of all, and it's also <coughs> something that uh, is considered on a, a broad scale across you know, the 47 countries, whereas the Irish situation is really considered here um, uniquely. The second reason is that we re continue uh, to have a lot of areas in relation to the ECHR Act of 2003 in relation to which we have questions, <coughs> uncertainties and problems um, that we have to work out and identify uh, and the reason it's so important for us to do that is the third reason why my focus <coughs> is on the act rather than the convention and that is that the convention is not part of Irish law. The ECHR Act 2003 is the way, the prism through which the European Convention on Human Rights is used in this jurisdiction. It so happens that through the schedules we have many of the same provisions transposed into Irish law but in the tr traditional or classical sense of dualist incorporation, it would be an overstatement to say, as you all know, that the convention is incorporated into Irish law. Therefore, the act is what we have to work with. Um, and you see from the title of my paper that, in my view, the story so far in terms of the act is quite a quiet one. It is more of a whisper than a bang. And a lot of the paper might feel quite pessimistic um, as I go through it, but do please be assured that there is an optimistic note at the end. Uh, so I've worked in a weekend feeling um, for the end there. So the ECHR Act of 2003 is a deceptively complex little piece of legislation, uh, which as you know contains three primary <coughs> operative sections that we're concerned with. Section two uh, is the interpretive obligation uh, section 3 is what we call the performative obligation or the obligation on organs of the state to perform, perform their functions in a manner compatible with the convention and section 5 is the well-known declaration of <coughs> incompatibility. Um, these sections and these claims are designed in a way to interact with each other. Section 2 is the core, in my view, is the core provision in the ECHR Act, the interpretation provision, because first of all, it is a, a mechanism for making a claim on its own. So one can ask a court to use section two <coughs> to interpret up, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, interpret up a piece of legislation or a rule of law to be convention compliant. And if you could do that, that in itself would be really the function of the act, right? We've got to the place we want, which is convention compliant domestic law. Section three, which is the obligation of organs of the state to perform their functions in a compliant manner, is one that section two feeds into, because what we expect <coughs> organs of the state to do is to comply with the law as interpreted in a convention compliant manner. In other words, as interpreted in a section two type way. And section five connects also with section two because the declaration of incompatibility, which I'll also speak about uh, later on, is a remedy <coughs> of last resort. So if you can have an interpretation up under section two, you don't need a declaration of incompatibility. So you've brought the law into compatibility. Now, we haven't in this jurisdiction haven't had a huge amount of academic debate at least about whether our focus should really be on section two or section five. Unlike in the UK with the Human Rights Act where that was a hugely contentious question, should advocates focus on the interpretive obligation 
or focus on the Declaration of Incompatibility. But you'll see by the end of this paper that my view is clearly that the interpretive obligation is really uh, where the action is. So that is where, that we ought, where we ought to focus. So let me move on then to section two itself. And you'll see that I've uh, reproduced it there in the first page of the paper um, because part of the difficulty here is with the wording, you know, some little clauses within the sections that bear teasing out. So section 2.1 says that in interpreting and applying any statutory provision or rule of law, a court shall, insofar as possible, subject the rules of law to such interpretation and application uh, that is compatible with the state's obligation. So what we do in section 2 is we, instead of having to audit every rule of law that we have in statute and common law and equity and so on and change it through a codification process or something to be convention compliant, we say, <coughs> you know who's really good at interpreting law? Courts. So let's just reinforce that interpretive function through section two so that any piece of law, including the law that predates the ECHR Act, we can attempt to interpret it up uh, to make it convention compliant. That is in itself not a terribly controversial or difficult proposition. The difficulty here is with the limitation clause that's built into section two, insofar as possible, <coughs> the law is to be interpreted in a convention compliant manner. And the question that arises is where those boundaries of possibility lie in relation to the court's interpretive function here. There is one clear boundary of possibility, and that's the Constitution. We couldn't possibly expect a court to interpret a piece of law up into a convention-compliant shape or, 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 or content that was not compatible with the Constitution. So on a substantive level, that's very straightforward. Where the difficulty arises and has arisen is in terms of those fuzzier or more difficult boundaries around the separation of powers and around our conception of what it is appropriate for courts to do, or indeed courts' conception of what it is appropriate for them to do in the course of interpretation. There are two possible avenues. There is the minimalist approach and the maximalist approach. So the minimalist approach will say, well, let's just ask if what we understand the section to mean and what is within its kind of pretty straightforward textual boundaries is convention compliant. And if it is, we'll do that. But we won't go further than that. We won't, in a sense, change the meaning or change the sense of a statutory provision to make it convention compliant. That is what a maximalist approach would embrace. I say, well, the legislature has given us this interpretive function, and so even if the interpretation up to convention compliant levels might give the act or the piece of law a meaning that wasn't anticipated, we are being seized with the right to do that by the piece of law itself. 